So, although the poem I will be sharing with you tonight is about us, my poetry, I must admit, never began for the collective we. I must admit that although tonight I will be talking about how we must seek to understand one another and make connections, I began poetry simply because I couldn't understand the large, confusing, and complex moments that surrounded me. My words became an outlet of sorts for me by which I could release this pent-up confusion on a page, and it turns out I really, really enjoyed it. Before I knew it, words were spurring out of me. I found words that carried texture, color, words that I was able to see. I realized that everything I'm able to see in these words, others must be able to see too, and that's when my poems started to connect me to others. The poem I wrote for tonight is called Not Too Far. It goes, God gave us night so we might gaze into this effortlessly crafted universe that lay around us in naked form. There we may realize how far we reach and how, if we reach far enough, we may reach the stars. Why, if I climbed upon my roof, I would have brushed fingers with this lonesome moon who feels so out of place in a constellation of stars, so much like me, so much so that it is unusual for these oddballs to be too far apart. And if I clambered my way above, dusty roof after dusty chimney, past dusty pairs of shoes that lay on this dusty ground with their dusty clothes, donned in the finest robes of misuse, abuse, no use at all. If I climbed my way through the atmosphere, surely my fingers could find the farthest, farthest planet, which, though it may look distant, is still not very far. If I would reach my pinky up and let the universe kiss my cheek and burn my fingers to ashes with stardust, I'd realize something. I think if we held up our arms to experience the pain and burn our skin, what we suddenly realize is that we're not very far. We're never very far. So if one must penetrate the clouds to reach the expansive universe above, let him do so without a ladder, because those stars were never really that far. Although I must say, I've never reached those stars myself. But I still assure you, they're never too far, you see. They never really are too far. Every one of us, whether we realize it or not, desires to reach the stars, and sometimes we get hopeless or confused. We wonder if those stars are just impossibly distant and think that these seemingly infinite cosmos will never allow us to even get close enough to graze our pinky finger. Those stars, for each of us, mean something different. For some, those stars mean a dream or yearning, that's been burning within us for years. For others, it's a relationship we desire to reach but can't have. For others, it's freedom from what could very easily be considered mankind's worst enemy, the mind. But this dream, be it known or unknown, acknowledged or unacknowledged, lives within us. I'd like to bring the example of one of my favorite novels, uh, The Great Gatsby, which is revolves around the character of Gatsby. The, the dream that he had of spending his life with the woman who he loves. In the book, there is a green light, which could possibly be a symbol of Gatsby's love for this woman or his dream. And he realized that his dream was never very far. He also acknowledged that the, the dream that he had could possibly never be reached. That didn't ever stop him. Similarly, I believe that if we open our arms and make a dream or desire within our hearts to understand one another, we will once more realize that what we are striving to achieve is closer than we might expect. Glancing over at the people who surround you and acknowledging the differences in our skins is all right. Those skins are a part of us all and they shape our identities. But remember that although we may seem distant from one another, we are never quite too different. You see, you and I, we truly aren't very far. We never were very far to begin with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paper scissors on who gets the Dr. Hey, Seuss mic. And Clinton always wins. I'll take the Dr. Seuss mic. <laughs> so he won, so he gets this? Oh, yeah, no, no. Drew gets I do. Okay. <laughs> so um, Nathan and I work uh, with an organization called Pangea. We've been working in Uganda for about 11 years now. Um, and through that time, what we've done is kind of shifted uh, while we've been working because we've learned while we've been working. Um, now we primarily, we've always focused on education, but we primarily focus on literacy 
And I like, I like to tell a lot of people we're in the storytelling business. Mm -hmm. um, so we love events like these and we love hearing other people's stories. Um, but I'm gonna let Nathan tell a little bit about how our mission came to be and how we came to focus on what we're focusing on in Uganda and, and why it matters. And I'll tell you about what we're doing here in the United States. I love it. Hi everyone. Hi. It's great to have everyone here tonight. One of the things I love about such an event, it's about stories. And with stories, there's always history, right? This particular moment, I know Sarah told us to close our eyes, but I want us to close our eyes again. And think about, please close your eyes. Everyone is looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> think about your very, very favorite childhood book how it felt to hold that book in your hands. Who were the characters in that book? Why did you love that book particularly? Who was telling you, who, who was reading with you that particular book? Take a moment. Now we can have our eyes open. Do you have that feeling in you? How did it feel? Can I have a few people to share? And can I know your favorite story books? The childhood books. Anyone willing to share? I loved biographies. Okay. Autobiographies, and especially ones that had a lot of adventure in them. They mm -hmm. open up the world for me. Amazing. Do you have any specific one? I loved the book Peace Child. Peace Child. Why? It was set in Papua New Guinea and it made me want to live in another part of the world. Amazing, amazing. Anyone? Can you repeat what they say so it's in the mic? Oh. There's a story called Peace Child. <laughs> it was set in Papua New Guinea and it kind of embodied adventure and made you want to live in another place. Great. Um, yeah, so every one of you here I know has their own personal childhood favorite book. I did have my personal childhood favorite book and my book was called Gulu Gulu Goes to School. And the reason that's why I loved Gulu Gulu Goes to School is because Gulu Gulu was this goat that loved education. Can you imagine a goat <laughs> <laughs> wanting to be in school? So Gulu Gulu found her way to school, um, no matter the obstacles. And that, that story resonates with me personally because that's a kind of life that I went through. But I want to ask each one of you here, do you remember a story not read from a book that someone ever told you? Show of hands. Childhood. Yeah. Now, in Uganda, there is a culture that every time during the evening, what I've seen in the West is that you get to be read a book for when you're a child. Before you go to bed, your mother comes or your father comes and reads for your book. But the work that we do, we have seen that most children don't have access to books. And really, most of them don't even see a book. You only see a book while you're at school. So we thought, but the culture that is there, sorry, the culture that is there is that every night, families get together and stories are shared before you go. So that is our dose of the book you get a story read to, uh, told to you rather than being read to you. So we thought, how can we take these two different sections? Uh, there's a part of the story and then there is the lack of the books. So putting these two pieces together, um, we are working on producing children books in Uganda. And we produce these books from oral folklore stories. And then we get this into children's homes. How we do that is we do that through the mobile library. A mobile library in Uganda, just to give a context, in Uganda we have a population of about 42 million people. But we have about only 47 libraries. 47! <laughs> now, I was working in my time in the US here, I've seen almost each area that I go to, there is a library. And I'm like, I wish I was this fortunate to have such access. But the beauty is that we are getting libraries into people's homes through the mobile library. 
Uh, the mobile library is basically a bicycle and you have a container on the bike and we pack these books onto that container and someone rides around every week to give books to families. That's, what a, that's the kind of work that we do in Uganda. But beyond just providing books, we also do teacher training. So our work is related to getting children literate uh, by incorporating three core, core groups, the school, the home, and the community. And we have brought those books back here. We initially started doing this as a fundraiser, um, but as a heterosexual Christian white American male, I didn't realize all of the books here were made for me. Um, it turns out 77% of children's texts in the United States are white only or, or animals only. So there's a huge, we're, we're at a depravity for different types and diversity and, and just types of stories that reach here in the United States. So we've found a secondary mission underneath this um, because we think it's quite important. It's important for Ugandan kids to learn how to see themselves in their own stories. Uh, it's important for all of our kids to learn how to see Ugandan kids in those same stories. So we're bringing them here. We've been speaking with schools, chatting with kids, um, and it's amazing. There's a Ugandan community here, which we're so excited about. Um, we've been sharing in this community, but also um, outside that community. Keep talking. Yeah, just I'm just coming up. To say hi. <laughs> How are you? Doing? Good, thank you. Very good. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to listen to stories, especially stories from people, stories about people far away, stories that you may have never heard. Thank you for coming. I grew up in Uganda and came to United States almost 40 years ago. I've lived in United States longer than I've lived in any part of Africa. Back in my heart, in my, the back of my whole being, I have always treasured education. I came here, started teaching, got my license and started teaching. I got into Montessori education through my, our last son, my husband and I have five children. One of them is sitting right there, <laughs> starting our own family with my son-in-law, Chris, and she's the middle child. Our last son brought me into Montessori education. And what I loved about it has been simple. The definition that education is a help to life. It's not about getting that big job and the big check. Yes, that will come. But a life that is fulfilled will get the money. The money will just come. So once I retired, I wanted to do something about my, the land that raised me, my roots, the, the place that made me actually survive in the United States. And that is the children in Uganda. I don't know how much you know about Uganda and Northern Uganda. Uganda is a small country the size of Oregon. And how many people live there? What did he say? 42 million. Yeah, so think about that. Try to put 42 million in Colorado and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> the story of the children got worse in Northern Uganda when 30,000 children were abducted. The war is over since 2005, 2006, but the scars of wars are everywhere, especially on children. Imagine this, that 38% of the children in Uganda, especially in rural areas, especially in the northern areas, one of the six are uh, poverty areas, 38% do not finish seven years of education. That means an illiterate group of people are growing up. And every time I go to Uganda about twice a year, I am just blown away that my generation are more illiterate than the children who are 10, 13. That keeps me awake. And I wanted to start a, a fresh start. 
And I thought, the Montessori education, of course, of course. <laughs> Find a place, a shed. And so under the mango tree, 2018, April, we just went with my Montessori friends, literally my Montessori friends, and started a Montessori outdoor learning experience under the mango tree so the board members and the community could see there was no mystery in Montessori. Montessori actually started among poor people in, in Italy. And the magic was that the children were using their hands, water, washing their hands, washing their clothes. We told stories. And now this, the concept has grown fully into a school. There's still no building, but it's a school in the heart of the people in that area. It's among the urban poor. We have the land, we have surveyed, it's within the municipal, so the building needs to be approved by the municipal engineer. That process has made me sick. <laughs> <laughs> but I am not the president of the world, so I must go along with what is being, what is required. To date, we hope to build just a kind of a log house and get the children there, at least 80 children. We found a wonderful training Montessori place, Africanized Montessori place in Nakuru, Kenya. So we are training four people there. I was daring enough to take a 12 hour bus ride into Nakuru uh, just three or four weeks ago, came back alive and still standing alive. <laughs> My ears did suffer a lot. But we hope that you will share that story, that when we start with young children, there's a chance. There's a chance that they will just be joyful about life. Actually, young children don't know that they're poor unless they don't eat, they don't have clean water, and they're sick because of dirty water, because of lack of food. The goal is to energize that community. It's among the urban poor, but they, with one week of that outdoor school, they tested the joy of education and the joy of seeing the children happy. One child went home and said, bring all the dirty dishes. Papa, bring all the dirty cups. She's three years old, all the way to the ground there. She washed all the cups. And the next day, dad comes to school walking. I say, hi, what's, he said, I want to see what you guys are doing with these kids. <laughs> so it is that we hope that in February of next year, that uh, the municipal will give us a green light to start with 80 children in that shed while the building is still going through its stuff. The fundraising to do a building is going on. My current hope is to raise money to do a borehole by January so, so that there's clean water. The joy of those children is that they can start a foundation that enables them to finish seven years of education and become literate, to have our eyes to live today. I thank you for listening. And 10-year-old hockey is legit. Like, it is a whole thing. So we were screaming all weekend. And now I have no voice. But they're worth it. They were amazing. Uh, it's so nice to meet you guys. I am Brandy Lee of Beauty for Ashes, Uganda. And my story started with stories. A lot like we're talking about now. In fact, earlier you asked about what stories and books impacted us. So as a little girl, I loved to read. Like I was like nerd level reader. Okay. So I always had a book in my hand and my parents' rule was for every two mystery novels, Nancy Drew, thank you very much, novels that you read, I had to read a missionary novel. And through that, I fell in love with the world. As a little girl, I know other girls might have dreamed of like Prince Charming and castles or I don't, I don't know what they were dreaming about. And I was dreaming of Africa. I was dreaming of mud huts and thatched roofs and lands I had never explored. 
And then I did really nothing about that. <laughs> it's just my dream as a little girl. And then nothing came until I sort of accidentally started a nonprofit in 2011. It wasn't a plan. And in fact, I had gone to Uganda a year after I'd adopted my son from Liberia. And I remember being in Liberia in 2007 and them opening the door of the plane, actually in Ghana was our first stop, and opening the door of the plane and me thinking, I'm home. Like this was my dream as a little girl and I'm actually in Africa. And I felt like I was losing my mind. Here was my dream come true. And then life happened and I found myself divorced, alone, having lost everything and everyone, and pretty sure that the lies that were being spoken over me, directly to me, were true. Lies that said that I couldn't do anything. I was now a single mom of a four-year-old, a five-year-old, and a six-year-old, processing trauma with crazy PTSD. And so I believed the lies. But I went to therapy like it was my job. <laughs> And eventually, I began to heal. And as a part of my healing process, I began to dream again. And I read this book by Nicholas Kristof called Half the Sky. Has anybody read that? It's so good. Everybody should read it. Like, write it down right now. Um, Half the Sky. It's about the oppression of women worldwide. So it's not like a beach read, necessarily. It's pretty heavy. But I found myself intrigued. He talks in the book about sort of rooftop ideas of how you can change the world. And then he talks about grassroots ideas. And he began to talk about women's cooperatives in the developing world. And that if we can go into the developing world and we can empower women, then they will change their communities. And honestly, I read the book thinking I would do nothing and was just like, yeah, yeah, rah, rah. Like that sounds amazing. I should follow some people on Facebook who do that. And then he started talking about education, which you've heard already about tonight. And I heard the fact that a girl in sub-Saharan Africa had less than a 20% chance of even going to secondary school. And that number is completely different if you are orphaned or if you are the child of a single mother. Well, a month after I read that book, my friend, Akwango and Grace Alotu, my Ugandan friend, calls me and she says, we are supposed to start something. And I tell her, no, I'm not starting anything because I'm a single mom and God doesn't use me in that way anymore. She said, really? Because I really want to do women's cooperatives. And I said, well, okay, so I kind of want to do that with you, but I don't want to start a nonprofit. Well, Fast forward eight years now, and that's what we do, women's cooperatives. So we have the privilege and the honor of working in Soroti, Uganda, which is sort of north central Uganda in rural villages. And we get to work in 34 villages. And now, after saying I wasn't going to start a nonprofit at all, uh, we have 41 women's cooperatives and 1,230 mamas in our program. So, right? I definitely didn't plan on that. But we have the privilege of going into villages and finding single moms and widows that want to meet together and that want to change their own futures. So what they're doing is they're meeting in groups of 30. So 30 moms are going to get together weekly and they're going to encourage each other. They're going to empower each other and they're going to pool their own resources. So what they're doing is they're bringing like the equivalent of 50 cents every week and they're putting it in what they call their lady bank. And that fund is growing larger and larger, and then they're giving loans to each other because we believe that they are the ones that are gonna change each other's lives. So that's still the core of what we do. But then we realize that our moms hadn't gone to school either, and that it's really hard to grow a business if you can't count, because then you're getting cheated at the market. And so we started what we call Literacy Plus, so now our moms go to school two to three times a week. They're very proud of this. Some of the groups have made their own uniforms because they said we are schoolgirls now. And they're <laughs> super thrilled with it. And they go to school two to three times a week to learn reading, writing, basic math, sanitation, hygiene, nutrition, agriculture, and business. And now they're changing their lives. 
Now they know math. And so they're saying, I'm not getting cheated at the market because I know profit and loss. And if I don't, one of the sisters in my group does, and she's going to come tell me I'm not doing my business right. <laughs> and that that's going to change. So we are getting the opportunity to see Ugandans change Ugandans' lives. And that when they work together, we recognize that we are better together. And our mantra is, you are loved and you are worth loving. And our moms say it to each other, and they say it to us when we greet each other and we say it to the people that we get to walk with because we believe in mutually transformative relationships. We're not there to change Uganda. We're there to learn and to see a greater picture of beauty because of who they are and because of their stories. And in the process, we get to start a school fund and send some of our mom's kids to school. So we have a thousand kids in our school fees program going to secondary and vocational school and 175 university students. And then we get to find out that our moms don't have water. So we do clean water projects in each of our villages. And then we run across kiddos whose mama and their dad may have passed away, orphaned in this world, but we say, no way, we don't use that term. And so those 47 kiddos are ours. And we, I have the honor of them calling me mama and Nick, papa, and we get to put them in foster families and get to make sure that they go to boarding school. Our real hope is to see long-term sustainability and deep healing so that every mama we work with, every kiddo we work with, and every person who comes in contact with us knows that they are deeply loved and absolutely worth loving. So I'm so excited to be here. My name is Favorite Regina and I come from Uganda. I actually don't know, but uh, I've been in Uganda for about 20 years and I was born in Rwanda and then went to Congo because of uh, genocide and what has been happening. I found myself in Uganda mm -hmm. and that's where I have lived and today I'm here. I'm so excited that you are all here and listening to whatever I want to say. So uh, I started by saying that uh, we have heard all about stories in Uganda, the books being written and people trying to take out um, what our kids or our children in the world need. Um, what I would say is that what we are doing is uh, about voices telling our own stories. But then you don't get to tell a story or even you don't get to speak about something if you have not read it from somewhere or you have not been told about something or you have not experienced it yourself. Sometimes we tell from our experiences and that's how we come to write books or even tell stories for other people to learn from us. And that's what we are doing in Uganda. And we are working with refugees with, with in Uganda. They talked about uh, the 46 million people in Uganda, but that excludes refugees who are living in Uganda. Mm -hmm. And over a million people or refugees, mm -hmm. uh, the, the South Sudanese, the Congolese, the Rwandese, the Burundians are all living in Uganda. So it's another additional thing. But then, because of different experiences, people are traumatized. Mm -hmm. People have grown up not reading books. People have grown up in war. They are not able. Where do you expect a refugee child to get a book to read? Where do you expect them to sit around the fire or sit gather like we are today to be able to their parents or their grandparents mm -hmm. to tell them to tell them stories. Mm -hmm. It's different. So what we do, we get them to speak up by sharing their experiences of how they have grown up and how they have grown up so that they can share and the rest of the world turn from it. Myself, uh, growing up, I came to meet Gaia Onozo in 2012. And that's when I started speaking out, becoming confident, because sometimes when you're traumatized, 
you don't know who you are and you don't know what to say, what to do, and then if you are not taught or you can be someone, you can be something, you can think of something different, then actually it's just sit back and keep quiet and then we fold our hands. But then that's not time that Saudi the Nenny Productions that we are working with. We are producing films, helping kids tell their own stories mm -hmm. and then publishing them out. And then for other people, Americans and the rest of the world to learn from the other side of life on mm -hmm. how people are living. So we so far have um, trained over a hundred kids those are children, both girls and boys, into filming. And it always, um, for the training of each child, it always costs us um, $500. And then we have also tried to help some of the kids go to university. And I think we have to connect with brand to help us also take some of you of them <laughs> to, the, to school. So we are very excited that we are here and then we feel so much connected that when people come out and tell their stories, we learn from them in one way or the other. And <laughs> you can tell why she's the the person that um, is speaking so so much for us. I, I just wanted to say. I wanted to give you an example of if this film that was made over four years in Changwali Refugee Settlement features Favorite and four other refugee women from South Sudan and Rwanda and Congo. And the film is told completely in their voices. There are no experts speaking about them. There are no um, anyone else other than themselves. And they use their cameras, they interview each other, they write poetry, they dance. Then we also use local filmmakers to come and get some footage of them as they're walking to school. Favorite story, she, she just trusted so much. She just shared her story of fleeing Rwanda. And then she was a mentor for many of the other young women mm -hmm. to come out and talk about what it is that they remember or don't remember, and they would draw, they would dance their, their past. This film that was made by one of the women in the film, her name is Wimana Beatrice, and she's from Congo. After the film, she fell in love so much with holding the camera yeah. um, that she decided to make her own short documentary. It's just yeah. been finished. It's now in festivals around um, the United States and, yeah. and the world. And she's hoping very much to um, get her story out there to many, many people and inspire other young refugee women and boys to be brave enough to uh, put their own story on camera versus having the UNHCR tell them what to say, right? So if you want to know more about those projects, there are some free DVDs on the table if you want to see the film that features favorite. And then you can find out about Beatrice's film with this piece of paper here. We're hoping that in addition to regular education, regular education, standard education, that um, the young people in the, in the many, many refugee settlements in Uganda can have an opportunity to uh, hold a camera, yeah. write a story, yeah. publish it, draw, dance, and have their own mark on it. I want to acknowledge that this is like a fire hose situation of so many stories. And I know lots of these stories and I it like pains me to not go deeper. So I want to say there's some, sometimes there's this gift of being able to um, cozy up with someone for an hour and, and go deep into their story. And we do that sometimes. And today we've chosen to have this blessing of hearing from four different amazing uh, organizations doing really incredible things for the purpose that um, we just kind of get to have a whole bunch of seeds scattered in our garden tonight. So the ones that you want to hear more of, I will be following up with the emails and the websites and Believe you me, the, the, the things that happen after these gatherings, the ripples of conversations and of steps and of um, collaborations, um, it, 
that's what will happen. So, so if it's paining you like it is me, you have <laughs> good company. So we have just a few minutes to um, have a, a little fireside chat. Um, and one thing that I want to ask the duos is, will you talk a little bit about, um, because what I know of the pair of y'all is that there is rich, deep, friendship that has fostered the creative collaboration that has fostered the work that is fostering the difference making and will you just speak to um the tie between y'all that has been a part of of your project your organization the film please and you've got to use the puffy mic and talk right into it kind of project please because it won't amplify your voice Okay, so um, I think my tie with Gaia was in 2012, as I mentioned, and we came to meet when I didn't know her, and I think it was through someone, and I was not actually knowing, I did not know what I was doing, uh, but because I just knew that people used to come like they come to a refugee camp and they want to know like how the life of refugees is and everything and he said okay maybe i would share my story to help someone or it may save someone or impact someone so i did it like for the sake of doing it i actually didn't know what i was doing until we connected more until now and we are good friends i i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, as I said before, there was a, a huge uh, leap that Favorite took to to talk with me and t and tell me her story, and I don't know where that came from. I, I I discredit her and her faith in people and humanity and her belief in telling story, but I ended up spending over the course of four years a lot of time in Uganda, and I went back and I brought back footage and I brought back photos and I, I met other people, I met her family and I think that for me the friendship grew not only from that initial spark of her um, faith but in my commitment to not stop. I was mm -hmm. going to just keep going as long as it took and um, I think that that's just something that um, brought blessings to me and favorite as well. Gail, will you just for a moment speak to your part in Nini Productions and the film South D? Because mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure people hear that part. So Sauti means voice in Swahili, and it's a documentary that um, follows um, the experiences of five refugee women living in Changwali refugee settlement, and it follows them as they begin secondary school. And um, the, there was no script; there was it was all very organic. But the the vision was that they would use their own voices and their own dramatic styles to let me see and those all around us and, and documenting it um, what particular challenges faced them as refugees trying to stay in secondary school. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee, which oversees the camps, are not required to provide secondary school education. Mm -hmm. They have a mandate only for primary school. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, it was interesting to me to see what happens when there are strong women, smart women, whose fathers and mothers supported them, wanted to go to secondary school, mm -hmm. how are they going to get that? How, mm -hmm. how are they going to make that happen? Mm -hmm. Favorite ended up going to university. Yeah. One of maybe five women from the settlement who made it to university. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Woo. Mm. <clears throat> Friendship, connection, brotherhood. Oh, yeah. Um, so Nathan and I have known each other for a little while, like six years, we think. 
Um, and whenever we when we started our organization a long time ago, we we had a, a, a really simple concept, which is hire on character. You have to have something like basic mm -hmm. so we can work with, but hire on character. It's the most important possible thing. What's great about that is everyone ends up becoming your friend that you work with. <laughs> so we, we've gotten to know each other for a while. And I think, uh, you know, I've seen Nathan go through life, right? I mean, his wedding, his, uh, his children, and now he's asking, where am I? Where's my wedding? Where, where am I going to be children? <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I think that's quite, I think that's quite fun. Um, but I think it's also it's more enriching, too, because, you know, our work has two sides of a coin. Right. And we're, we're both kind of sharing about each of our cultures mm -hmm. and our mission means something different to each of us. Um, so part of that's, I think, just been wonderful because you're in it with somebody. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're learning from somebody kind of on, an, on a day to day basis outside of like who does accounting and who doesn't have to do accounting. I have to do accounting um, <laughs> and, you know, all the other responsibilities. Well, I guess Drew has said it all. Um, our journey, actually, I remember the date it all started. Uh, it started on the 6th of May 2014, <laughs> which has been a very incredible journey. Um, not because we look at ourselves as a boss and employee, but rather we look at ourselves as peers and people who are willing to learn from each other. The thing about us is that we are age mates. <laughs> the only difference is that I'm older than him. <laughs> <laughs> By two weeks. <laughs> Still, I'm, I'm the eldest. Yep. He's your elder. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, that's something about us. And I think the journey that we are into right now is the journey that we have envisioned with our work. And I think so much is yet to happen. And I believe... Um, Having the two of us work together will lead us to where we are foreseeing ourselves being. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Like you miss my so, Brandy, will you, because you, in your story, you talked about a moment where your sister <laughs> called you and, and cajoled you or, or yeah. quite invited you. Yeah. Can, can you speak to the, the sisterhood aspect? Which oh, is yeah. so at the core of who you are and how this organization started. Yeah, I love what you said about that we hire on character because um, I think it's really typical sometimes to have organizations where there's a part in the U.S. and there's a part in Uganda and the U.S. like raises money and makes a lot of rules and then the Ugandans like carry it out and there's not – there's not that peer relationship, right? Would you guys say that that's common in Uganda? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like all of us are saying, like, we don't like that. Like, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense for there to be any hierarchy. Although that is a temptation, I think, because, like, who makes the rules if there's no hierarchy? But for Anne and I, Anne is my sister in Uganda, and... She's the one with all the wisdom. Like, she's the one who's like, no, we're doing this. I'm like, we can't do that. That's too scary. And she's like, this is what we will do. Okay, Anne. And we've decided that we just want to be a boat that has two captains mm. and that we want to be led by what's right and what um, we feel like God is saying to us and what's right for our mamas and that we believe that we all have something to bring to the table. And so... Our staff, we have only indigenous staff in Uganda. So um, we have 11 full-time staff and then 17 literacy coaches and 10 school mentors. And they're all family. Mm -hmm. When we go, it's we're sitting around our family table. And my uh, Rita is Anne's sister, and she's our field director. She's my twin. And her she has two new babies. She married our school program director. I made that happen. <laughs> First time I met him, he had a girlfriend, and I prayed that one away. And he married Rita, and her their two kids are named after my parents. So they have Larry and Terry, which are kind of silly names for little Ugandan babies, but we love it. And Rita plans on having twins. I don't know how she controls that, but this is her plan. She plans on having twins and naming them Brandy and Rita. We are not having twins. <laughs> so, and yeah. speaking of we, when did you get married? Six months ago. Oh. Woo! Yes. To a really good man, because I've been to Uganda three times since we got married. <laughs> and he's having to hold down the fort here with the kids and everything. Wow. <laughs> and he went from zero kids to 50. 
So, <laughs> so I'll jump it into the deep end with us. <laughs> so yeah, I love the the family here that you can see. Makes me miss my Ugandan family. Yeah. Marcelina, yes. will you speak to? Because I know you, and I know you do everything in community with your brothers mm -hmm. and sisters. So will you speak to how community has been a part of um, <coughs> your steps that you have taken to make this Montessori dream in Northern Uganda happen? Because mm -hmm. um, I know you're not a woman going it alone. No, no, <laughs> no thankfully, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> My, uh, we, we actually, 2016, around this time, Thanksgiving, almost Thanksgiving time, huh. we sat drinking coffee with my retired principal and a very good friend in Southeast Denver. And I and we talked, now that you're retired, what are you going to do? <laughs> la, 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 la. And then say, school. <laughs> Where? Uganda. Obviously. <laughs> How? I don't know. <laughs> but it, it it just, it brought out what was in my heart and what was in the back of my mind. And pretty soon five uh, people came around the table. They are now the advisory team because they know more about Montessori and they've done Montessori in Mexico and, and other than, other, in a place other than this. And then in Uganda, 2017, I started talking to my former classmates and workmates who are still alive and walking on their two legs in Uganda. <laughs> there are two of them run their own businesses. One is an activist who is always on the radio every Saturday. Huh. I said, I want you, the one who is always on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. <laughs> yes. And so it's, it's that kind of community. And then we went to uh, the community around and then literally that day, I was taken to this neighborhood and I found a child playing with grass. Her mother was washing their laundry near the well they should be drinking. And that's a common sight on Saturdays. Where do you think the water, the dirty water runs right back into the well? So I stood there looking around and my eyes fell back on the child and was still playing with that grass very peacefully. And uh, I know, I know there's something more. Mm -hmm. So next the child picked a stick and played with it. And at that point, I walked forward on that land and I knew it was gonna be on that land. Mm -hmm. And when my friends came, they say, yes, the mango tree is calling mm -hmm. us. So the oh. first classroom 2018 actually happened on the mango tree. The name of the school is not in my name, not in my mother's name, but Mother Earth. Yeah. Mother Earth because the crimes against children has been way yeah. more than two-legged humans could cure. Yeah. And so it is Mother Earth. And there's some information here. If somebody's interested to see some pictures of the children actually. But it's community, community. And the was most wonderful thing this last six weeks I was in Uganda, it went to the community of women because they kept saying, we can only afford $5 a month to pay for school fees. Because I kept telling them, we have to keep the teachers paid. Otherwise, they'll run away. And then there's no school. And they said, we can afford $5. But then I said, I can, we can work to make more money. So we collected bottle tops. And pretty soon, we started making placemats mm -hmm. with the bottle tops. And I came back oh. with coasters, and I did pay them. And I told them, I'm paying you not because I'm rich. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is about 50 cents. <laughs> but it's because I want you to know that your labor, the gifts of your hands mm -hmm. and eyes, yeah is what you have to work with. Yeah. So we collected bottle tops. I went to the market and there are a group of women I've been helping for the last 10 years. And they're my children. So I said, mama is here. You need to give me all your fabric remnants that you're never gonna use. 
And that's what you see here. And I will sell this and I promise them that the proceeds from here will pay for abandoned children in the neighborhood. There are children who are thrown away because they're gangsters of youth who cannot cope with life anymore. But they have children and they throw them away. And some people who are kind take them. So the next Saturday I'll be selling a whole lot of this at a craft fair and the money will go back to pay for those children because I want them to know the fruits of their labor can enrich them just like in your case. Thank Where's you. Where's the craft fair? The craft will be at First Universalist Church on uh, uh, Colorado Boulevard and Hamden and then First Plymouth Church. So they run, those two churches run this craft show every year. It's called World Market <coughs> Alternative Gift Fairs. There will be over 100 different nonprofit organizations. Mother Earth will be there trying What's to the raise money. Next Saturday and Sunday, okay. 9, to two, 9 to 4. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So um, my invitation for y'all is um, in a short, you know, 30, 60 seconds, short and sweet. What's the word, the last seed you want to plant here tonight? Um, we're just going to pass the mic down the line and it can be anything. Um, but... Yeah, what's something you want to leave everyone with? Marcelina, will you start? Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for making a choice to come and hear stories from near and far. You are the change maker. Thank you. Can I take the time yeah. she didn't use? <laughs> you went so short. I like it. Um, you know, if I could ask you guys to think or pray or... Um, whatever you feel led for. We're getting ready to start a campaign at next week called Heal and Thrive. And we've heard a lot about trauma tonight. And we are getting, um, in 2020, we're going to partner with an organization called Tutapona. Have you guys heard of them? Oh, yeah. Tutapona. They're amazing. And what they do is they've developed a trauma healing curriculum that they're using in refugee camps mainly, and that people who go through their two-week program have a 60% reduction in PTSD symptoms. Oh and so we are, our dream for 2020 for our mamas is that they might heal just a little bit more. And so we're hiring two Tutapona staff to come live in Sarodi for six months, and they're going to go through that program with all of our moms and do individual counseling with mamas who need it. And the thing our mom said is, can you help us find healing? Because when our minds have peace, our businesses can thrive. Wow. Yeah. Right? And so then we're also partnering with Sarah Ray, who we both know, who just has written a curriculum, a 16-module extensive business training curriculum. And we're getting that translated into a TESO. But that means that I have to raise $30,000 in the next two weeks, about $20 per mom, to so that they can have trauma healing and extensive business training for 2020. So if you could be thinking of and praying for anything, it will be that. We also may have just said yes to building a school. Yeah. Anne and her big ideas. Uh, so that might mean I have to raise $35,000 for land. Um and I don't know how any of that's going to happen, but I didn't know how any of this was going to happen. So it's going to have to be miracles. So I think we all love, we get front row seats for miracles, right? Mm -hmm. It's bigger than mm -hmm. any of us. And that's what makes it fun to be a part of. We get front row seats. Oh, gosh. Um, a word that I um, want to share with you is uh, the word grace. And... I think there's so much grace in the world. It's magical. It's in that candlelight. It's in the smile of Sarah and her home. And it's in the people that are all sitting here quietly listening. 
hmm. doing something that's kind of not done so often. Hmm. And I would just encourage all of you to notice grace. Hmm. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. What I would say is that um, sharing is caring. So when I share with you, that means I care about you. And I want to learn from you as you want to learn from me. Mm. I think usually my grandmother says, um, you don't want to disrespect a host in a home. So I want all of us right now at this moment to rise up on our feet and give a big applause to mm -hmm. Sarah. <laughs> It is, thank you, Sarah, for getting all of us here. And thank you all for coming around to listen to our stories. Today, it's us telling the story. And I believe tomorrow, it's you telling the story. Um, I'm excited to see new people. And I think as I come to the end of my trip in the U.S., <laughs> it has been a graceful period. But I want to say thank you so much. You guys are the reason as to why the world keeps on changing. Mm -hmm. Your being here shows that tomorrow is better than today. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ruin the happy feelings with leaving you with a challenge. Um, I don't think it's enough for all of us just to be allies. I, I think we're all responsible and accountable for being advocates. Um, the beautiful thing is you get to choose what you advocate for. Um, we would love to tell you about the things that we're advocating for. Um, you know, and for us, I think that's my personal thing. I think as, as an organization, one of the things we believe is the world's full of a lot of untold stories. Um, a lot of people in the room have them. In fact, everyone does. That's the, that's the beautiful thing about it. Um, with Christmas coming up, I'd be remiss not to pitch you that we do have children's books. So if you <laughs> if, if you want to hear other stories, if you have kids, or if you know people that have kids, or if you know teachers, basically anybody could use a children's book. Uh, we'd love to sell them to you. Um, and we also just, we're in the midst of signing a publishing deal right now. So if you do, per which is great, which is wonderful. If you do purchase them in the next two weeks, we actually are able to take all the proceeds and actually make sure they get to Uganda. Otherwise, we only get a percentage. Uh, but more people are going to read them, which is great. This, this has been such an inspiring evening and I just am so glad to be a part of it and um, I'm so excited to tell you guys about a project that I've created called the Sisterhood Photo Project. Um, <laughs> um, so the project is very simple. Um, as Sarah said, um, I'm a professional photographer and have been for 15 years along with my husband. Um, so we photograph people. Our passion is really to photograph people. And um, so for each client that purchases an authentic portrait session for women, I donate another photo session to a refugee or immigrant sister. Um, these photo shoots are created for a very specific purpose. It's to empower women to feel seen and to see themselves in the highest light. Um, I have found that where there's trust and connection, a photo shoot can unfold into, in a very beautiful and organic way. So throughout the session, um, we start with a small meditation to ground ourselves, and then we explore the different facets of what makes you you. So not only do we find your joy and your most exuberant smile, um, but we also explore the parts of you that feel strong, the part that's softer and still, the part that wants to move and dance in the world, and each part is welcome at these photo sessions. Um, the first woman that I ever photographed in this way was my dear friend, Heather. She had been through a very um, emotionally abusive marriage, and after five months, well, five months after leaving her husband, 
Um, she had two children. She had no car, no job, no health care or child support, um, and in her own words, no identity. So um, five months afterwards, I visited her and we did a photo shoot together. And as the session went on, I could see literally life coming back into her. Um, she dropped into her body and she started to feel who she was again. So when we looked through the photographs together afterwards, her tears began and they were seemingly endless. She found herself again and actually saw herself. So as we watched, we started putting words to her photographs, strength, grace, beauty, power. This was a turning point in her life. It was a step to catapult her in her own healing. So my clients consist of grandmothers, mothers, sisters, daughters, nurses and doctors, students, um, artists, small business owners, and more. Um, my clients use their sessions for all sorts of things um, to celebrate milestone birthdays, to create content for their online business uh, presence after different times of transition, or just because this moment in time needs to be remembered and celebrated. So I also want to tell you more about my donated sessions. Um, they are given to refugee and immigrant sisters who may not normally be able to gain access to a session like this, but could really benefit from it. I have met the most beautiful refugee sisters who have gone through immense tragedy, heartache, or loss. With respect and empathy, my desire is to listen deeply to their stories, to offer support on their healing journey, and to celebrate the inner light that continues to shine within them. These sisters are survivors. They deserve to be seen, as we all do, and they deserve to see themselves in their highest light. I've had the absolute honor of photographing women from many different countries, Iraq, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Uganda, Afghanistan, and more. Um, the other day, I heard a quote that stuck with me ever since, and it said, when you are stripped of everything, you come back to just being a human being. Mm. And I think this is what we need more than ever right now. We need to connect with each other human to human. We need to focus on loving ourselves and lifting each other up so that each of us feels whole and radiant. These photo sessions are a way to do exactly that. Um, I have taught English as a second language both here and overseas for many years and, as I said, um, have been a, a photographer and a journalist um, and found that my calling is to help stoke and reflect the light that shines in each one of us. So I hope that you will consider supporting the Sisterhood Photo Project um, as a way to bridge cultures and bring together the support and sisterhood of women. There are several ways you can do this. The first is to purchase a portrait session, uh, which in kind donates another session to a refugee or immigrant sister. And the other way is to support our cause by following us online on Instagram or Facebook um, at Sisterhood Photo Project.